hot and I'm nervous. Hey everybody, it is Jenny B here riding solo on the back porch, um, which for the record, I'm not sure why I chose to film out here because it is hot. So pardon the sweat if I'm sweating, I'm also nervous. Um, this video is unlike anything that I've ever filmed before, but something I've been thinking about doing for a long time. This video, as you can probably tell by the title, is about pancreatic cancer and losing somebody that you love to pancreatic cancer. So I've wanted to make this video for a while, been putting it off because I'm not exactly sure what to say and frankly I don't like talking about this but I know that when I was going through it I wanted something like this to know what to expect how I was gonna feel what was gonna happen and I couldn't find that so that's why I'm making this video to hopefully help somebody who may be going through the same thing that my family went through so a few disclaimers before we start this video is purely my perspective. I am not a medical professional. I am not anything other than myself and I am purely speaking from what I felt in this time. This is not the same thing Joni B felt. It's not the same thing that my granddad who passed away felt. It is just me and I've tried to make myself some notes so I can stay on track and also I'm going to be reading a few journal entries that I made during this time. So let's start with a timeline I have that written down to kind of help keep this video on track but it's probably gonna be a long one and probably gonna be a little bit rambly because that's just how it is but for starters this happened in 2018 my granddad was the one who was diagnosed and passed away from pancreatic cancer I will link some articles in the description box all about the cancer itself pancreatic cancer sucks and it is one of the hardest to detect which is why a lot of people who are diagnosed aren't diagnosed until the very late stages which is exactly what happened with my grandfather the symptoms can mimic other things and doctors don't always notice so there you have it so August 31st 1997 was when my granddad was diagnosed with diabetes that was a long time ago and from that point to 2018 he never had any complications other than having diabetes I mean that in itself is a complication but he never had to go on insulin he was always able to keep his blood sugar under control and never have too many problems related to his diabetes flash forward to May 2017 my grandmother passed away for probably 30 years my granddad was my Mama's caregiver, so that was something he did. He helped cook for her, he cleaned the house. Toward the end of her life, he helped bathe her and clothe her and everything. He was quite literally her lifeline, and that was a huge part of his life. He did have a job, he worked up until months before he passed away, but a huge chunk of his life was taking care of my grandmother. So naturally when she passed away in May of 2017, his entire life took a huge shift, which is why my mom and I moved down here to Fort Walton Beach, Florida, where he lived to help take care of him because we knew he was going to need some extra help. So starting around, I want to say the winter time of 2017, probably toward December, he started getting sick. He was really nauseous, didn't want to eat which was really unusual for him because he could eat a lot, but he just wasn't wanting to eat anything. He was feeling sick all the time and he was still working. And naturally we attributed that to grief. It hadn't been that long since my grandmother passed away and his life had been completely turned upside down. So he kind of refused to go to the doctor for a while. And then the beginning part of 2018, he did go to the doctor. They said, hey, your blood sugar is kind of out of whack. So we're gonna put you on insulin, okay reasonable he's a diabetic bound and determined to do everything on his own and stressed out grieving okay so his blood sugar is out of whack let's put him on insulin they put him on a certain dose of insulin which didn't really fix anything so we forced him to go back to the doctor and they were like hmm we'll up the dose of insulin I'm gonna put another disclaimer here and say that due to things surrounding my grandmother's death I already had 
issues, I guess you'll say, with the entirety of the healthcare system. Um, I'll link a video in the iCard that discusses what happened with my grandmother. Her death was a direct result of the incompetence of a medical professional. So by this time, I was already skeptical of doctors and the way they treated people, especially elderly people. So I already didn't think my granddad was getting the best care. We took the road trip of a lifetime in June of 2018. My mom, my granddad and I drove from Florida to Pennsylvania and went to a family reunion. Had a great time, but could clearly see that my granddad wasn't doing well. We were at an amusement park and he was slower than normal, out of breath, tired, feeling lightheaded, still not wanting to eat. So when we came home, we took him to the doctor again and it was kind of the same runaround thing. It's just your diabetes. Flash forward from June to August, my mom was very frustrated with the doctor. She was always the one that went with granddad to the doctor because he couldn't be trusted to tell them everything. So she went with him and basically it was an enough is enough sort of situation. Like something is not right, he's not getting better. The insulin is not doing anything, he's still sick. His blood sugar was still messed up. Something's wrong, run some tests and figure out what's going on. So they did that. And then this is probably between August 8th and 10th at this point, we get a phone call from his doctor saying, you need to go to the emergency room. Something flagged on his test results. You need to go to the ER. The ER in Fort Walton Beach sucks. Sorry, I'm not even gonna bleep that out. I don't even care. If you know, Fort Walton has an awful, awful hospital. That's where people go to die. So we did not take him to that hospital. We drove down through Destin and San Destin and went to the ER down there. And we were there for several hours before my granddad was taken to Pensacola by ambulance to get full tests and everything run. At this point, we didn't really know what was going on. There was talks of cancer, but other things could have been wrong. They just knew something was wrong and Pensacola was going to take care of it. So now, like I said, this is probably August 18th. Go to August 11th, 2018. He was officially diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, stage four, which anytime you hear stage four cancer of any kind, it's just like, well, that's a bummer because there are only four stages of cancer. But at this point, I think I'll at least say for myself, I did not accept that this was going to be it for him. I did not accept that he was going to die because of cancer. He was 79 years old, which for some people that's really old, but in my eyes he was definitely supposed to live way past 100 because throughout my entire life he'd always been healthy and active and a huge, huge part of my life and I never in a million years envisioned a world that he wasn't in. So I'm still in full-fledged denial at this point. They have said stage four pancreatic cancer, but I'm like, eh, no, it's fine. He's gonna be fine. So flash forward a few days to August 15th, 2018. They performed a lung biopsy on my granddad to see how far progressed things had spread because they saw in x-rays MRIs, whatever, that it had spread to his lungs, but they wanted to see what they were dealing with. So they did a lung biopsy and it came back super bad. <laughs> Confirmed that the cancer had definitely spread, it was still spreading, and it was just not a good situation. So August 14th through 15th, I'm sitting up in Bud's hospital room writing this by the glow of my book light and the nurse's station. Granddad is out. Here's the thing. I imagine living in a world without Momo because she was sickly for so much of my life. I imagine living in a world without dad because of his job. I've even imagined a world without mom because of her cancer. She had breast cancer in 2014, if you didn't know that. But I have never, not for a moment, imagined a world without my bud. Every memory of the future, he was there. Memories of the past, he was there. Now all of a sudden, some doctors are telling me he's dying. How can there be cancer in so many of his organs when no one knew it was even in one? How is this happening? Why is this happening? I'm going back and forth between being anxious to bitter. I just can't imagine 2018 ending without granddad, but that's a possibility and a chance. So now I'm just sitting here trying to decide if I want to run around screaming or just sit here. Later that night, August 15th, home for the night. Hospice came in and that seems to be the best option for us at this point. I can feel the pull of Satan on my peace and my sanity, but God is pulling harder. 
There's something so beyond amazing just around the corner and through the door. We just have to get there. Right now I'm praying for healing for my bud. If there is any chance he can be better, I want him to be. So I mentioned in one of those journal entries that he was gonna have a port place that was supposed to be for chemo and any other medications that he might need. He ended up not having that port placed because after talking to doctors, they said that there was no chance that chemo or anything was going to cure his cancer. If anything, it would just prolong his life and give him a reduced quality of life, which he already had. He was already sick. And we had this very long, painful discussion in the hospital between my granddad, my mom, and myself about what that meant if chemo was worth it. And at first, my granddad was like, yeah, I want to do chemo. I want to fight this. But after talking about it and realizing that all it was going to do was make him sicker and the thing he hated the most in the world was being nauseous and knowing that was all it was going to do, we ultimately decided not to do that. And so we moved forward with hospice, which I will talk about in just a moment. But I have a very short journal entry on August 17th, which is when he was moved to the hospice wing. Maybe I should mention, so... At this time, he was in the hospital in Pensacola, which is about like 45 minutes to an hour from where we live. So we were switching off days. One day I would be there with him. The next day I would come home and Joni B would go. And that's how we were switching back and forth. So we were driving back and forth to Pensacola, all kinds of stuff. So August 17th, he was moved from the normal hospital to the hospice wing, which I'm sure you all know what hospice is. It's for dying people. I feel like I need to apologize real quick. Um, one reason why I didn't want to make this video is because there are some things that happened throughout his journey that have made me a little bit cynical towards some things and hospice is one of those things. So I want to apologize. You've already made it this far in the video. If you have, I'm going to go ahead and apologize for anything that I say that might seem insensitive or that you might disagree with. Maybe you had a great experience with hospitals and with hospice, what have you. Like I said in the beginning, this is my experience. These are my rambly feelings about what happened that I hope help somebody. So back to the journal. August 17, 2018, I have the shortest journal entry ever. I'm writing this at midnight in the darkness of granddad's hospice room. Why is this happening? And then I just have in capital bubble letters, this sucks which kind of just sums up the entire experience, to be honest with you. <laughs> so this journal entry that I'm about to read is probably the most candid thing I've ever written in my life. It's very accurate to how I was feeling at the time, and I remember these feelings so clearly, and I remember writing this so clearly that looking back, I wouldn't change anything I wrote here, even though some of it is a little bit upsetting probably to listen to when I read it but if you've been through the process of losing somebody to cancer then you know that it just sucks everything out of you and it really is an awful experience but just to set this up he's still in the hospice wing of the hospital in Pensacola at this point he is on a steady medication system consisting of a lot of morphine and it's making him kind of lose it a little bit. He's going through serious fits of anger where he's just angry about nothing and everything at the same time, which is hard to watch, but as somebody who knows him, we were able to kind of help him calm down. The nurses couldn't really do anything. They didn't really do anything. So that's what's happening here. This is August 19th, 2018. I can hear the Boy Meets World theme song playing, albeit muffled, in the hospice room next door. It brings me some strange sense of joy, and right now I need all I can get, so I'm not complaining. My eyes are heavy, but my brain is heavier, and there's no way to let me sleep, at least not well. The morphine is kind of making him wacko. He's having fits of anger, and it's overall just emotionally and mentally draining. I wish someone would give me some meds. Might help. I feel the life being sucked out of me faster than him, and some days I wonder who will die first. There has to be a wayward bus or a stray bullet out there for me, right? But I can't just let mom do this alone, so we better hold off on that. It's all just so confusing, and I feel everything and nothing all at once. I tried to explain it to, bleep, a couple nights ago, 
and send a text. Then I realized how ridiculous it all sounded, so I sent another one to say I was cutting myself off from texting her about any of this. I think she thought I was joking, but I'm not. I don't want to see or talk to anyone. Then again, I probably should since it feels like my brain is about to explode. August 19th again. Home. Watching The Office and allowing more brain cells to die. It's great. So before this situation, I had so many friends tell me about The Office, as I'm sure you do. It's kind of like a cult following. And I tried to watch it so many times you could never get past the first episode. But in a time like this, when every ounce of me was exhausted and the emotion was just physically impossible to feel and everything was just heavy and upsetting and I couldn't sleep and I couldn't think and I could barely breathe. In that situation, a show like The Office was perfect. I didn't have to think, I didn't have to use any brain cells and it was phenomenal and I fell in love with the show during that time. So you might be the same way as me. If you're in a situation where you're grieving really hardcore and just hurting, try watching a show that takes literally no effort. No brain cells need to be used. The Office was that show for me. <laughs> I hate to say that I'm ready for this to be over because that would mean Granddad would be gone. But I'm so tired. I can't focus on anything at all, ever. Confused. I can't even tell you what this emotion is called. It must have a name, but I honestly have no idea. How do other people do this? I just don't get it. When he's doing good, he's really good. But then he's nauseous and angry, and then he's confused about everything. He isn't really in pain because he's on a really good medicine regimen at hospice. I want him home because I want him to be at his house in his last days, but I also want him to stay a while longer at the hospital because for now the stress of all this isn't at home. I'm not ready for that to change, but I know it has to. I feel like I should also document some dreams I've had in the past few days. <clears throat> the first one was the running naked in a store. I don't remember this dream at all. Another was me at Morningside, my former school, visiting my professors. Two of them, Bleep and some rando, were dressed as that weird hunter from Looney Tunes. And then Bleep was somehow Meryl Streep. That one's a real mystery. I do remember that dream. The last one was last night. <clears throat> I got a phone call from Mama. I put it on speaker and asked Granddad if, she could, if he could hear her. He could. Then she said, soon we'll both be home. I remember Granddad smiling, and then I started to call Mom and Dad because I knew he was about to lose him. Because I knew I was about to lose him. Then today, Granddad made the comment that I shouldn't be worried if when I got back he was gone. He said he'd be in a better place. So there it is. Everything I needed to document. I also told Mom that if I'm ever in the hospital that I don't want anyone to come see me in the hospital. I just want to be left alone. Mom can come, and so can Dad, but no one else. And that's also how I feel right now. Just leave me alone. I still fully support 2018 Jenny's assessment. If I'm ever in the hospital, I don't want anybody there. <laughs> I watched people come to the hospital when he was in there and in, in hospice. They'll come, oh, how you doing? Well, he's dying, that's how he's doing. Thank you so much for stopping by. So, and then he was pretty much out of it all the time, so then it was me talking to people, which I don't even normally like to do when I'm feeling great. So, why would I want to do that when I'm feeling like basically the worst I've ever felt in my life? So, that's how I feel about that. What else do I need to address here? <clears throat> the weird dreams, yes. The scariest one by far was the last one, when my grandmother was on the phone and he could hear her and then she was basically saying he was gonna die and then nobody was answering my phone call and he was gonna die and then that same day I went to get lunch and he told me what I said in the journal entry, when he come back, don't worry if I'm not here. And that scared the living daylights out of me. So shortly after this, this was August 19th, shortly after that he came home from the hospital, which was, I'm gonna say the beginning of the end. I guess is the best way to put it. <clears throat> so we came home from the hospital. Hospice brought everything we needed, a hospital bed, a wheelchair, all that stuff. And it's kind of it. In our situation, hospice was useless. And I'm not afraid to say that. If you had a different experience, I'm so happy for you. But in every sense of the word, hospice was useless. They did nothing. When we got home with him, 
he was about the same as was in the hospital, except now, obviously, we were giving the medication instead of the nurses, which was fine. We developed a system where Joni B was the morning and afternoon nurse, so she'd get up at 6 o'clock and start his med progression from then, and I would stay up until 2 or 3 in the morning to give his last doses of medicine. That's a cycle that we were on. And he had these jingle bells we gave him, so if we need anything, you could just jingle them. Sometimes he just jingled them because he felt like it, which sometimes still in my nightmares, I hear those jingle bells. We still have them. Um, that's something I can laugh about now, but I obviously wasn't laughing then. <laughs> he would just like, ding, 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 ding. Oh my gosh, they do work. Yep. <laughs> in the time that he was home, I think that I was processing the fact that he wasn't going to be here long and that was really hard for me. I fought that feeling for as long as I could of him not being around long and I tried to convince myself that either he would get better by some miraculous thing because I do believe that prayer works and I was praying harder than I have in my entire life that he would get well. So it's the part of me that just believed that the cancer was just going to go away and it was going to be this miraculous testimony of how God's amazing, which he is, despite everything that happened. And then there was a part of me that believed he would live for a long time. The doctors had said probably six months was how long he was going to live. So I just kept telling myself he was going to live six months, he's going to live longer than six months. So at this point, we had a hospice in Pensacola. And one day, um, schnitzel hit the fan real hard and some things happened in the house. The police were called and escorted a member of the household away. And then, literally like five minutes, the cops were still there. Granddad was in the bathroom and we couldn't get in to the bathroom. We didn't know what was going on. He wasn't answering us. And we were freaking out because that's obviously not a good thing. Dying person in the bathroom, not answering anybody. So, honestly couldn't tell you how we ended up getting in the bathroom. The door must have been unlocked or we banged it in. I really don't remember, but we got in the bathroom and he was on the toilet completely motionless. Um, he was sitting upright, he was breathing, but he wasn't registering anything that we were saying to him. We tried to get him up, we couldn't, and we knew something was wrong, so we ran outside. The cops called EMS, who came and got him, and unfortunately took him to the hospital that people go to to die, aka Fort Ormage Beach Medical Center. And in the car, we're following the ambulance, we call hospice in Pensacola. First thing, we knew it was going to take them a long time to get here, and we knew they needed to be here to help us with whatever this is, because that's what hospice is for, right? To help you with crap. First thing they tell us is that we shouldn't have called 911. When you have an emergency, you call 911. Somebody unresponsive on the toilet is an emergency. So, we did the right thing by calling 911. Not the point. So we called them and they were like, okay, well, we're gonna send somebody. Cool, so we're at the hospital now. They are running tests. At some point, he regained some of his faculties to where he could like make noises and kind of talk to us, but not really. So he's in the ER. It's been, let's say two hours it's been. We call hospice again and say, hey, here's the update of what's going on. Um, are you gonna send somebody to help us out here? And they're like, yeah, we sent somebody. Okay, fine. The hours tick on by and they're running tests, they're doing all kinds of poking and prodding, there's lots of moaning because he's in pain and not doing well, they don't know what's going on, hospice is still not here. It got to the point where it was four or five hours later, we're still there, hospice is still not coming and we're just frustrated and pissed off at this point because what the heck is the point? Um, hospice does eventually show up around the same time that the doctors finally figure out what's wrong and they say that he's septic, which is not good. Um, I'll link articles because I'm not a medical professional, so maybe that can help with some of these terms that I can't really explain. But what I understand about sepsis is there's an infection in his body. 
I mean, there was already cancer in his body, but now there's something else in there that's not doing good things. So the hospice nurse lady shows up. We tell her what they've told us. And what does this woman say to us? She does not say, okay, let me go chat with the doctor and see what we can do about this. She does not say, oh, let, let me help you take him home and we'll see what we can do about this. No, this woman straight up says, oh, this is it. You should probably say your goodbyes. Plot twist, that wasn't it. He did not die that night. <laughs> hospice nurse, useless hospice nurse, left. We took Granddad home. At this point, he was like talking. We got him in the car and he was hungry. So we went to Whataburger because that's where you go when it's in the wee hours of the night, in the morning. Went to Whataburger and got him a burger. Between Whataburger and getting home, which is like five minutes, he had once again lost all the faculties and could not walk or talk. This is a moment that I remember so vividly and in the moment it was so traumatizing, but now looking back, it's actually kind of funny. It's probably not gonna sound funny to you, but it is funny to me now for some reason. My mom and I literally had to carry him almost into the house and that had to be the most hilarious thing <clears throat> so the whole time my mom is like okay you got to help us out you got to help us you got to move you got to move your legs you got to do this uh, we did end up getting him in the house thankfully it took a hot minute but we did it we got him seated at the dining room table and now it's time to eat so he can't eat anything so mom is ripping off little pieces of burger helping him open his mouth to put it in, helping him chew. He is swallowing. Thank the Lord. I don't know what we would have done. So we got him to eat, I think, at least half that burger just through that process. And it was a wild one. So that was um, somewhere around August 24th-ish that all that happened. So the days go on. He's kind of different every day. Some days he's great. Some days he's not. They've upped his nausea medicine. We've upped his morphine at the direction of our hospice nurse. We switched hospices also, something to note, to one here in Fort Walton. <coughs> they were also just as useless. Um, every time the hospice nurse would come, we would tell them, hey, we can see that he's deteriorating really quick. Like, really, really quick. Things are happening and it's scary. And every time the nurse would tell us basically that we were wrong, that there was no way that he was deteriorating this quickly, that's just not how it worked, and just don't worry about it. Just give him his medicine, give him food, give him water, and he'll be fine. He would go back and forth between like not really there to he is there. And then around, <clears throat> I think it was September 4th, he was as alert as he had been in a long time, since we'd had him home basically. And my mom and I sat in his bedroom and talked to him for hours and hours about memories we had had. He thanked us for taking care of him, told us what good care we had taken of him, how grateful he was how sorry he was for everything that was happening, how much he wished that it wasn't happening. We talked about everything. He said that we had done everything right, that we had helped him so much. And that night, I asked him, I said, do you think you're gonna make it to the new year? And he told me no. And I said, do you think you're gonna make it to Christmas? And he said, I, I don't know. So that, is a conversation that I will remember for the rest of my life. It was the last real conversation I had with him. We definitely needed that because of what happened in the days to come. We needed that reassurance. I'm gonna stop saying we because this is about my feelings, but I needed that reassurance that we had taken good care of him that he knew that we had done everything that we could to make him comfortable and help him through this because the next few days he lost everything, lost all 
comprehension of what was happening. He lost the ability to go to the bathroom by himself. He stopped recognizing us. He thought he was in a nursing home where people were being abused. He thought that I specifically was trying to hurt him. He would scream at us. And if, if we hadn't had that conversation, it's on a Saturday night, it would have been so much harder to go through the next couple of days because this man was my best friend. Joni B is also my best friend, obviously. We work together, we do everything together, but granddad was different. Um, growing up, we would go to Sam's Club and do sample day, we'd go to the Dollar Tree, so this is my bud my main my main man so for him to not know who I am and to be thinking that I am somebody who's trying to hurt him that was really hard in and of itself but I was able to separate it knowing that on Saturday he told us how he felt so this person who didn't know me was not him that he wasn't there anymore that there was nothing left of him at this point so that made it easier. The days went on. He got quieter and quieter. He started having the hiccups, which to me, to this day, is one of the worst things I've ever witnessed. He, his tumor was pushing on his diaphragm and causing him to have hiccups that couldn't go away, which the hiccups are miserable anyway. And so to be in pain and to be sick and then to have the hiccups on top of that, he lost the ability to kind of tell us what he needed and what he wanted. He couldn't take his pills anymore, so we had to crush him up <clears throat> into water and give it to him that way. Um, and then September 6th, 2018, if I remember correctly, it was very early morning, so like, midnight 1 a.m. if I'm remembering correctly to be honest with you it could have been late night and going into September 7th I was sitting with him in his room he had the hiccups aggressively as he had he was sleeping from what I could tell I had music playing as I always did I had been playing this one song it's called give me Jesus and I don't listen to it too much anymore just because when I do, it reminds me so much of this time because I played it all the time for him. But I had that song playing and he had the hiccups, he had the hiccups. I'm praying for them to stop because he needed to rest. At some point the hiccups did stop and I sat in there with him beside his bed as he took his last breath, which I'm grateful for and then I'm not. I'm glad that I could be in there with him, but for a really long time, up until probably a week and a half, two weeks ago, I have held on to so much guilt from that moment. Joni B was sleeping in the next room. I knew that he was going. And I remember thinking I should get up and I should get her so she can be in here and then I, I didn't do that. So I felt guilty of not letting her have that moment with me and also I think that whenever maybe this isn't true that when you're in the room with somebody when they die there's this weird guilt that you should have done something even though that's ridiculous because there was literally nothing to be done and more than anything in the world he wanted to be with his wife of 50 plus years and in that moment, he was. So there was no reason to feel guilty whatsoever. Um, 
As soon as I noticed he wasn't breathing, I went and got Joni B. We called hospice, and the lady came out and was shocked that he was dead. So yeah, that's like the whole thing. <laughs> the very long explanation, there's bugs everywhere, of what happened. As for emotions, all of them, <laughs> all of the emotions, the biggest thing that I remember is just never feeling like you could breathe because something was gonna happen. He was gonna need something. You couldn't sleep because he was gonna need something or something was gonna happen and you really need to be there. And I remember feeling very alone. And I really hope that if you're going through this, maybe you won't have that same experience. But throughout this less than a month time from his diagnosis of August 11th to his death September 6th, that is less than a month of him having cancer. So props to anybody who does that for years and years. You are a tough individual. I could not have done it, I don't think. I would have, but I couldn't have. <laughs> it felt like a lifetime we lived in that short amount of time. And it was quite literally Joni B and me, and that was it. And anybody who watches this, who knows me, and who was around during that time, I'm not making this video really for anybody but myself because I need to talk about this crap. And for somebody else who's going through it, it sucks and it's isolating. It is so isolating because your entire life is consumed with this thing. It's consumed with cancer and that's it. And so for somebody to say, oh, yo, call me if you need anything, like you don't know what you need. To be honest, you need this person to get better and they're not going to. That's what you need, but it's not going to happen. I think in those moments, I don't know what we needed. We definitely didn't have it, but I don't know what we needed. <clears throat> I know we needed spiritual support for one, and we didn't get it, which sucks so bad. And it's been something that I've been angry about for a really long time. We were going to a church at the time and our pastor did not come see my grandfather. He, a pastor from another church did. So if you're watching this, which you're probably not, thank you. Um, but our pastor did not come. People in our congregation did not call, did not come help anybody. Yeah. So I felt like in these moments, we were the only two people, Joni B and myself, who were advocating for anything. We were the ones praying, even though we were at the end of our rope, literally. Inside, at least I was dying. I was so tired. I was so frustrated. I was so sad, so scared, so upset. I needed somebody to stand in the gap for me whether that was praying for me, praying with me, doing laundry, cooking food, doing something. I needed somebody. Joni B needed somebody because we were the only somebodies each other had and we were both in the same situation. Like we were, we were in it. <laughs> like as in it as you can be, we were in it. And we needed somebody who was out of it to help us. Not to tell us that he was going to be in a better place. Because that's what we got from the friends that we had at the time. We got, oh, God has a plan. He's going to be in a better place. Which, disclaimer, I am a Christian. I believe that everything happens for a reason. And that, yes, God has a plan for everything. Yes, now that he's gone, he is in a better place. But regardless if he's in a better place, I'm still in the crappy place that I've been in. Regardless if he is happier in heaven, which I know he is, I am still here on earth. I am still grieving for someone who is gone. I am still suffering from the traumatic experience of literally watching him die. I don't need to hear you tell me that he's in a better place and that God has a plan. Because I already knew that, but I wasn't feeling it. I needed somebody to recognize that I was feeling 
all the feelings and that I was hurting unbelievably. So if you're watching this and you're going through this, I want you to know you're not alone. You are so not alone and that's one huge reason why I'm making this video, why I'm hashing all this out, why I'm sitting on my back porch talking about this is so you know you're not alone. The feelings that you are feeling, whatever they are, they are valid. You can be angry, you can be sad, you can be confused, you can be frustrated, you can be any feeling you're feeling is okay. Because believe me, you are going to feel all the feelings and you are going to be so confused about everything and it is okay. It is okay. I know that if you're watching this, you're probably not next door to me or down the street from me. You are probably thousands of miles away somewhere where I will likely never meet you or never hug you or any of that. So thanks to the world of social media, just know that our DMs are always open. Instagram is the best way to get a hold of us. So if you are going through this or something completely different where you just feel like you're isolated and you're dealing with this by yourself, slide into those DMs, buddy, because <laughs> you're not alone in this. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna come out on the other side and you are going to be okay. This year will be two years since all this has happened and I have finally gotten to the place where I can talk about this without completely losing it, where I don't feel everything as deeply as I did even a couple months ago. The bugs are ridiculous, golly. So know that it'll take time and that's okay. Don't let anybody tell you how long you can grieve. It's been almost two years and I'm still grieving and that's okay. When you lose somebody you love, you're the one who decides when you are ready to go back to normal. That's just how it is. Do not let somebody tell you that it's been long enough, that you shouldn't be sad anymore, that you should be over it by now, because that is, number one, not their business. And number two, grief is so personal. So you could lose somebody and in a couple months, you could be okay and moving on with life as normal. Or it could be four years and you could still be hurting and that's okay. The one thing I would encourage you to do is talk to somebody if you can. I, I guess that's supposed to help. I probably should have gone to therapy after all this happened because 100% guarantee you watching someone deteriorate and die causes some PTSD <clears throat> and 100% guarantee you I did not process that correctly which is why two years later I am just now processing trauma. So I do recommend therapy. Um, I find sometimes from the past going to therapy that it helps to talk to somebody you don't know. A professional is good or a stranger on the internet. Hi, once again DMs are always open. But sometimes it's hard to talk to people that know you because they think that they know you well enough to tell you how you're going to handle things, and that's not true. A mistake I made was telling myself how to feel things. I'm a person who, whether I want to admit it or not, feels things very deeply. <laughs> I'm a very sensitive person. I feel other people's pain very deeply. I feel my own pain very deeply, and I try to deny it all the time and say, nah, I got this, I'm good, I don't need to feel these emotions, this is ridiculous, this is stupid, but it's not. Let yourself feel emotions, because if you don't, it will destroy you, and I am living proof that it did destroy me. I've had many breakdowns since this situation, and I believe if I had processed my emotions properly back then, I would not be dealing with this right now. Even though he's not gonna meet my future husband or meet my kids, which really sucks, he's with me forever. Um, the feelings that I've had since he's been gone have been obviously sadness. I think you always have that when you lose somebody. But honestly, the biggest thing I've felt is anger toward everything and everyone, which is really bad. It's an awful, 
awful emotion to feel. Anger, it just, it'll eat you up inside. It's disgusting. I have felt anger toward people who have their grandparents, which is stupid. If you have your grandparents, that's amazing. I have felt anger toward people I once called friends, which is also not okay because obviously they weren't meant to be in my life, which is okay. I have felt anger toward the church for not being everything that I expect it to be, which is also not okay because the church is full of people just like me who fail and make mistakes. I have felt anger toward God, which is not okay because he does always have a plan even if we don't see it but he is God and he can handle it if I'm angry. I found myself angry when people get their miracle, which is something that <clears throat> I have felt since he was sick, basically. I would go to church or be around somebody and they would say, oh, finally this thing I've been praying for forever, it finally happened, and I would just immediately be angry, which... I hate that that is a thing that I felt because when somebody gets what they're praying for, that's amazing. I have gotten things that I've prayed for. It's not like my entire life has just been a series of things, bad things happening. So for me to be angry for other people getting their miracle is something I'm definitely ashamed that I felt, but it's okay. And I think that's a normal human response to losing somebody that you really care about. And it's something I'm coming out of, thankfully. The amazing thing about God is that no matter what you feel, He is still there. No matter how angry you are at Him, He's still there. No matter how angry you are at people, He is still there. And no matter how long you try to push Him away, He's still there. He's not a human who's going to get so angry with you for being selfish or for being whatever. He knows your thoughts and your feelings, so it's better to just be honest with him and say, hello, this is how I'm feeling. And he'll be like, all right, okay. I already knew that, but thank you for telling me. The person that you love, I don't know them, but I can guarantee that they would want you to live your life to the fullest that they would want you to push on and do amazing things and be amazing like you are, change the world, follow your dreams, pursue your passions, fall in love, get married, all of that stuff, they would want that for you. Just like I know he wants that for me. He never wanted anything but the best for me. He wanted me to make movies and do whatever weird crazy thing I wanted to do were whatever crazy thing I wanted to create he wanted me to do that he always supported Jonah B and I's dream at times he was the only one the only person who believed in us and there are times where it feels like we are the only two people left on planet earth who believe in what we're trying to do in the content we're trying to make but having his memory and knowing what he wanted for us and wanted for me has made me realize that despite the trauma of losing him, I deserve to live a full life. I deserve to go on in life and do things to make me happy and to be happy, even though he's not here. So whatever person you've lost or you're losing, they wouldn't want you to be sad forever. They would want you to live your life and be happy and know that you deserve that regardless of what has happened in your life. You deserve happiness. You deserve to live a full and wonderful life, and you will. To anyone who is on the outside of this situation and is not sure how to help somebody who's grieving and going through this situation, obviously everybody is different. But looking back, what I wished I would have had is just somebody to be there with me, somebody to get coffee with me, who wouldn't talk to me about what I was going through. Somebody who was not gonna tell me that everything's gonna be okay. That's what I wanted. So if you can just be there for them and make them lunch or take them to lunch or dinner and buy them a coffee and talk to them about the new season of 
Bachelor in Paradise or Worst Cooks in America or new movies that are out lately, <laughs> the weather, anything. Just being there for somebody and standing in the gap for them. So praying for them, praying with them if they want you to, giving them space when they need it and being there with them when they don't need it, making them feel safe, like it's okay for them to cry in front of you, like it's okay for them to be angry in front of you, knowing that it's not angry at you, and just really truly being there and seeing what they need, even asking them, hey, what do you need? And knowing that if they say, I don't know, that's okay. Sometimes all I needed was a latte. So lattes fix a lot of things or ice cream or a walk in the park or a trip to Walmart, you know? I don't know. Just be there for them. That's what I needed. Really, truly what I needed. I think that's what we all need. We just need to know that someone is there when we need it for whatever it is we need them for. And that honestly is the hardest thing to find, I think, when you're grieving, is someone who will just be there and who will pay attention to you and talk to you about what you want to talk about and not talk about what you don't want to talk about. You're not their therapist and you won't be, but just be their friend and be willing to go through this roller coaster with them. And most importantly, don't give up on them because as dark as it is now, it does get better and they will be so grateful that you were there for them. And for those grieving, don't give up on yourself either. I know it'll feel like you have hit the end of the brick wall, you've crashed, you're burning and lost, and, but don't give up on yourself. Things will get better. If you stay to the end of this video, I've been talking for over an hour about Lord knows what. I hope you got something out of this. Maybe just me talking about this. This is the first time I've really talked about it on camera. I feel great. I have no idea anything that I said and it's probably a jumbled mess, but hopefully if you watch this long, you got something out of it. Um, thank you for watching. <laughs> Please subscribe to our channel because I promise most of what we post is actually really funny. And we're going to be traveling again soon. We do not talk about cancer a lot. I don't think we do. But I felt like this video needed to be made. So if you got something out of it, I would love for you to let me know. You can comment. You can DM us on Instagram. What have you. And, uh... I'm going to go inside now and watch this footage and really hope it's not a train wreck. But um, sometimes grief is a train wreck. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed this video and will subscribe to see all of our other awesome content. Love you all and we will talk to you next time. Bye!